he wasn't tweeting. Okay. Oh, okay. We were looking for you back there. We, didn't, we can see you. It's so bright. You can see. Hey, hey, welcome to PitchCon 2012. I'm DJ Ski, joined by Scott Evans, to the left of me, as well as David Norton. And this panel today, is a, it's a great title. It's Where the Rubber Meets the Road, Creating a Content-Centric Profit Strategy, which is probably the most important thing for you to actually do with your content, is monetize it so you can pay the bills and live life. <laughs> I'll let you guys introduce yourselves and kind of let everyone know some of the things that, that you do to to, to introduce, to start it off. Sure. Uh, my name's David Norton. I'm the president of Ladder Up Media, which is mostly, or was born as a brand integration company. We've done shows like Miss Universe, uh, The Biggest Loser, Three Wishes on NBC, um, and quite a number of other shows where we've, we've placed brands in shows and literally made millions and millions of dollars for, uh, for different shows. And then utilizing that content uh, created licensing strategies um, to develop the brand into, into profit. So that's me. Well, thank you, David. I'm Scott Evans, and I started uh, about 12 years ago inventing products for fitness uh, equipment and fitness manufacturers, and then went into kitchen gadgets. And then being an accomplished inventor, people find that really interesting, right? So then I got uh, paired up with a buddy in San Diego and created a, a motivational movie called Pass It On. It was, came out shortly after The Secret, so it was kind of the unofficial uh, sequel to The Secret. And that led to uh, a partnership um, that created Personal Development Magazine. So I was a co-founder and editor of Personal Development Magazine. And something that might be interesting, just a little bit of trivia, and a tour that's starting in August. Uh, if anybody here has seen, or anybody watching uh, at their computer has seen the movie The Sandlot, so if I say, you're killing me, Smalls, what does that mean? <laughs> so in real life, I'm the little kid that went over the fence and pickled the beast for the dog. But he really got me. And uh, so my brother took that horrible traumatic story, <laughs> turned it around, reinvented the past, and made it a nice family kids movie. So that's a little about me and we'll learn a lot more about both of us uh, as we carry on here. That's incredible. And, and what I do beyond just being a DJ, some of you guys out there might be like, hey, why is it just a DJ moderating this panel? I've actually, beyond being on air and, and being on all these different you know, media outlets, have been building over the past five years my company, which I call Ski TV, which we basically are you know, the leaders in what we consider Verge culture. Verge is you know, a, a new demographic we've kind of you know, coined the phrase for. It's you know, kids nowadays growing up on the internet, you know, there's no more, for us, there's not many, you know, it's not just urban, it's not white, it's not Latino, it's kid. it's not just localized to where you are. We try to be the leaders in content for this demographic and market, and we, along the way, we've hit over a quarter billion YouTube views, and, you know, have over a billion views total between our different content streams, with Denny's, McDonald's, Taco Bell, anywhere there's a screen, that's pretty much where we are. So that is why I am up here hosting it. So um, <laughs> let's get right to it. How important is content for or creating content for the web right now with, within your guys' businesses? Well, I think it couldn't be more important because with the abundance of information out there, everything is essentially free. And, and I heard um, Chris Anderson in his book, Free, uh, he runs uh, Wired Magazine. He was commenting a couple years ago in his book. He said, you know, only about 17 or 18, maybe 19 percent of the people that use YouTube, for instance, upload videos and create content. So. It, because things cost so little to produce and so little to, uh, to, to project and get out to the masses, I think it couldn't be, one, any more important, and two, it couldn't be any more easy nowadays. Right. Absolutely. And I think the creation of content is, is one thing, but really, what's the purpose of creating content? I mean, we all have great ideas. Ideas are a dime a dozen. And um, I was telling these guys earlier that uh, my mother-in-law just called me with a, a great idea for a new reality show, but there's no brand in it. Yeah. Um, and so what we talk about a lot uh, at Ladder Up and, and in the things that Scott and I are doing together is how do you create a brand out of your content? How do you find a way to make that content make you money? And, and ideally, um, it is by creating a brand and it's creating something that people want to interact with or that advertisers want to get around. And one of the biggest things is getting a customer loyalty because the brand is really only, only as valuable as you have a, a loyal customer's base. And that's the most difficult component to anything anybody's going to do or we do together. And Ski, you're a pro at like getting in front of people. And, and, and you do what I counsel people to do constantly and that is get in 
in front of as many eyes as possible. Yeah. Because ultimately, that's what is available to you. And that's what, that's, that's what we're here for. Yeah, I feel like, um, I'd love to get your guys' opinion, but I feel like today it's easier than ever to get noticed, to, to get out there, but also as difficult to, as ever to actually survive and keep that up. Because you can go out and get all these views and do all these different things, but how do you monetize that? That doesn't mean anything at the end of the day. When we started off, we were getting a ton of views, but not necessarily making the money that you know, you'd think would come naturally with it. Well, what happens is one, one, of the, one of the key things to remember is most people that deliver digital media do it from a social motivation, from a vanity play. It's not a business play. So you have to get out of that. So if you fall into that contagion of social motivation, then you're not going to make any money at it. The key is to find the business because, and David will speak to that, because the, the thing is, if you treat it like a hobby, it'll cost you like a hobby. If you treat it like a business, it'll pay you like a business, potentially. Yeah, One of the things, line. when I was working on The Biggest Loser, um, uh, as the sponsor producer, one of the things that I started to say was, listen, this is a brand, it's a lifestyle brand, which, you know, of course, if you've ever heard anything about The Biggest Loser, it was designed as a lifestyle brand, and it was, it was meant to turn into a company eventually. But I started brainstorming, and I said, what do people who watch the show really want? Because you want to take it from being, what do I really want to tell the viewer, to what does the viewer really want from my content? And when it came to The Biggest Loser, what the, what the viewers really wanted is to be able to experience and achieve what the contestants on The Biggest Loser were able to do. I mean, we had people that were, started out 400 pounds and went off the show at 185. I mean, that's just an incredible transformation. We had women over 300 pounds who came in, you know, and wearing a size 6 dress. It's just an incredible transformation. So the viewer is living vicariously through them, but wouldn't they actually rather have that same experience? And so I said, listen, guys, we need to create an opportunity for people to have a Biggest Loser experience. And what better way than to create a resort where they can go for any period of time, um, experience the Biggest Loser lifestyle, lose some weight, get motivated, get educated, and, and move forward. And so my whole goal over the past five years has been to create a critical mass of Biggest Loser resorts around the country um, so that the Biggest Loser brand, even when it's not a TV show anymore, can live on as a service provider that's inspiring America to you know change their lives for the better. And so we now have uh, three resorts. The third one's opening this summer in Niagara. There's a there's a resort in Malibu and there's a resort um, in Ivins, Utah. And they're all beautiful resorts. Very, very reasonable to go to. I think you can get it, if you book four weeks, you can get it for $2,500 a week, all inclusive. It's an amazing experience. But that's prolonging the longevity of content. And now what's crazy is it comes full circle and now the Biggest Loser Resort is creating content to continue to market um, their brand and their product. And so we're seeing transformational stories that are coming out of the resort, and it's just great standalone content as well. That's pretty powerful because I think the, the, the trend you see there, or at least that I see there, is that, okay, so the TV show eventually is going to be off the air. It's just going to happen. It's going to run its, it's going to run its course. But that brand isn't going to be off the air. It's going to always be in the landscape of ideas. And that's the key. And essentially what the show seems to have done, wittingly or unwittingly, is something if we put our attention on, we can actually do. And that's what we try to do with everything we're doing together. And I know it's what you do. You enroll people in your conversation. Yeah. Just enroll them. Make it easy for them to contribute. Make it easy for them to start, you know, conversating. Right. I think that's a word. With their <laughs> friends and family. And of course, interacting, right? Because people aren't buying information when they're buying into what you have to deliver. They're buying information, but they're buying the platform and they're buying the interaction. And that's where the power is. It's the interaction. That makes it much more easy to enroll them in your conversation and what you have to deliver. I think you brought up a good point. For brands, how important is it to really, you know, do everything 360 degrees from, you know, a ground level thing like a resort to being on TV with a TV show to hitting the internet? When you did the Biggest Loser brand, for example, was that always what you knew going into it? This is more than just a TV show. Because a lot of times, you know, when you see stuff on TV and you'll see things come and go and it's just, just a TV show. Show, that's all it is. Well, I think The Biggest Loser was a platform for a lot of things. One, it was a platform for advertisers to get involved. And so early on, uh, you know, the first season I wasn't involved with, they brought in 24-Hour Fitness, and 24-Hour Fitness helped underwrite the show. Um, they built the gym, um, you know, so they helped reduce a lot of production costs. When I joined the show in season three, we took them from, you know, uh, basically increased by 500% the amount of advertising. Eventually, we scaled back. Um, but, the, but it really became a 
a platform for other lifestyle brands that agreed with this healthy lifestyle. So in terms of creating content, they did, I mean, the, the original executive producers went in with that in mind and they hired me to help execute that vision, um, and which we did with great success for 10 seasons. Um, but if you can create content with that platform in mind, that's not only uh, can it become a brand, but it's also brand friendly. And when I say brand friendly, I mean I'm talking about advertisers. It's a it's a 100% clearable. Nobody's objecting to the Biggest Loser content, or they weren't. Um, so w w clearable just means that all the advertisers are willing to advertise in there. And it fits so much of what a lot of advertisers are trying to say and were trying to say at the time about living a healthy lifestyle. I think that's a key point too you brought up. You know, people always come to me, I know, like, hey, I need sponsors. I have an idea. I want to want to get a sponsor for that. You guys actually yeah. went back within the things that you're doing and build it from the ground up so it naturally fits in. It's not, you know, you, you know which advertisers or sponsors you're going for. It's not controversial. It's not going to turn them off and you build in the places where it's a natural fit for them. Is that? A absolutely. And it I do a little program where people can buy me lunch and we, we sit down and we chat about their project and, and we talk about their content. And a lot of people say, well, I need a sponsor because they've heard I can play sponsors and have oh, all yeah. these great sponsors. And say, I need a sponsor. And my show is about axe murderers who kill baby chickens and feed them to... And I'm like, your show, you can't do that. It doesn't work. You're not getting that sponsored um, and you're certainly not getting it on TV. And so there's a reality check, I think, that we do with all of our our content is, can it be sponsored and does it become a brand? And I think those are the biggest things that I look for when I'm consulting with somebody, you know, whether it's over one of these lunches or in a full day event. Um, but but we, we always look for, you know, is it brandable and is it nice to other brands? One of the cool things is coming up with a name, The Biggest Loser. Yeah. That just is a hook, like in a, in a song, it's a hook. When we launched Personal Development Magazine, we paid an inordinate amount of money to be in to be in kiosks and have the big screens in airports carrying the magazine. And it's very, very expensive to to get to the point publishing a magazine where you can start selling advertising. I mean, Oprah, her pages are 150,000 a month. I mean, we were nowhere near that. But we were hoping to get 5,000 a month. That would have been nice. And we got a few of those, a couple of anchor sponsors. But we still needed to get more eyeballs on the concept, on the material, and on the content. And so what we did was we just said, well, wait a second, let's build a website. So I sat down. And I learned how to build websites, and I built out the personal development website. And it was because we needed to make more people more aware, because more and more people are sitting in front of the tube, the computer. We were talking earlier before we came on that you know we'll have the TV over here, uh, and we'll be on two computers, and we'll be texting and on a phone call. Uh, you know, this is the sort of thing that, that that the world has become, which is very cool. So how do you tap into that? So it's really multimedia, yeah. and and that's where that's where you have a better chance at gathering uh, advertisers, but most importantly, getting the eyeballs, because only then are, are, is anybody going to be interested in in paying you some money. Well, let's take it to the beginning. So when, when you guys come with an idea for, you know, whether it's a new show, a new brand, a new product, whatever it is, all right, you go out there, you, you create content for, for this piece. What's the next step then? Because you don't have a sponsor. You don't have a brand. How do you get it started? Do you need money to do that? What, what would your strategy be for let's all those Let's talk about watching? Body Bear Fitness and how that rolled out. Well, I was just going to say, there's, what we always say is there's no money in development except the money that's going out yes. the door. Somebody's making money in development, and it certainly isn't, it, it isn't the developer. Yeah, absolutely. Scott uh, created a product called um, the Cush Ups. The Cush Ups are a, a very simple exercise device. It's a, it's a, it looks like a yoga block with a hole in it, and there's a little two-pound handle in there that can pop out and be used as a weight. It's a very cool device. It's a cushioned push-up. It's a cushioned push-up. By, by the way, before we just really quickly, sure. it was so cool as a mass market product, Everlast licensed it from me, mm -hmm. and they sold you know, well over 100,000 units over the course of three years, but that wasn't enough for them right. to hold that product. So my 10-year license, they gave back to me in three years. So I needed to repackage it, not repurpose it because it was still purposeful, but I had to repackage it, and that's what we're talking right, about. And I, and I met Scott, and he said, hey, hey what about this product? It's, it's a cushioned product. It's going to... 
this is a, a chance meeting between two people and is sitting in a pub one day, uh, one afternoon. Um, <laughs> But uh, just just hanging out in the pub, and I'm I'm with my wife playing darts, and and you know uh, I thought he was Mike Rowe, and I was like, you're Mike Rowe. So I'm not Mike Rowe. But anyway, long story short, we got to talking about what we both do, and he's like, I've got this product that makes exercise easier, and we're always looking for things, or we are we're always looking for things on The Biggest Loser that could make exercise easier and more comfortable for the contestants. And I said, you know what? Let's just go ahead and let's put it on the show because it would make life easier for the contestants. And what did that do? When, well, once it got on the show... Well, once it got on the show, what that enabled us to do, it enabled us to say, okay, now, we have a potential B2B play here. Because it certainly wasn't going to be... It, it, being on The Biggest Loser, TV show was great going into a meeting with, at, at a corporate level and say, listen, we have some, we, we have some exposure. Uh, we have 8 to 10 million you know, viewers a, a week, right? A week? Something like that, or used to be. Anyway, it's a, a lot, lot of people, a lot of eyeballs. So we couldn't go to the end user with that exposure because they don't know they're seeing it. All right, they don't know they're seeing it. It's being used in the, and we actually had, uh, we have a billboard product on the show as well, which is called the Top Trainer. It's a gigantic apparatus they asked for, and nobody would deliver it until. We delivered it, and we, about a week after they asked for it, we delivered it, and we were golden. But the cool thing is, we can go into corporate, say Sports Chalet, we can go into bodybuilding.com, and we can, we can show them what we're doing to subliminally and actually show our product out there being used as a viable fitness product. Makes it comfortable, makes it fun, and if it's comfortable and fun, you're going to do it. If you do it routinely, you'll get results. You'll get results. So that was the play as far as being on The Biggest Loser, and it helped out quite a bit. But the idea behind it is, is um, you know, what do you, the, the first step is looking at your product and then looking at what resources you have under your control. What thing do you have under your control? What resources do you have that can take your product to the next level? Whether it's content, whether it's a physical product, whatever it is, what resources do you have? Who can you call on the phone right now to move that ball just another yard toward the end zone? Just another yard, just another yard. Because each of these things are just little tiny steps and eventually you know, you're building a bucket that cash starts flowing into. Yeah, most people are trying to make it rain. They spend all day making it rain. You see the busybodies trying to make it rain. But they're not spending time building the buckets to catch all the rain. So you can never really account for what kind of success, what kind of return, what kind of activity you're getting you know, around your, 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 the content. So out of all of the products, probably 12 or 15 products I've launched via infomercial, uh, uh, retail, home shopping, uh, online, I think the key, and something you just said was very important, is what are the resources? I, you know, at the time, 12 years ago, uh, I had a product that sold probably 70, 75 million dollars on TV over the course of seven or eight months. It was little fitness product called the Body Bow. But it, I didn't produce that infomercial, and I certainly didn't have the money or time or expertise to risk to see if that thing would even work on TV. So regarding resources, it may be somebody new, it may be somebody you met at a, a conference like this, but the key is to really assess and take inventory of your key resources, because we're all really, really resource rich. Now, I have a lot of ideas. I know a lot of people out there nowadays have a lot of ideas. Scott, you obviously <laughs> have a lot of ideas as evidenced by all that you do. When is it the right time, I know a lot of people are wondering this, for you to actually put these creative ideas that we all have in motion and actually start dedicating resources and time? What is your decision-making process with that? If I like it, I do it. Because I think if I like it, somebody else is going to like it. And the cool thing about the web, because I, I build websites on the Joomla platform. It's an open source. It's very cool. It's nice. It's nothing spectacular. But for me, being a guy that has a hard time sitting in one place and doing keystrokes and resizing images, that's a very difficult thing for me to do. But it's fun because as soon as I get an idea, like for instance, um, uh, there's a, a website. Are you going to talk about Fartopia? Oh, my, oh, no, I wasn't thinking about that. Okay, so I have a video site. This, okay, there's one silly end, I'll tell you. Okay, so there's a website called Fartopia. And it is a website that is an aggregator of uh, fart jokes, fart videos, and fart <laughs> news articles. Okay, fartopia.com. And you actually make money off of that. I sell t-shirts. I wanted to be able to monetize this. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll be here all day. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> now, you were going to actually talk about a different website uh, okay, so that I'm, can really help other people to achieve right. their dreams. Okay, so of course, you know, I build out housecallcoach.com, and for those of you watching on, and well, you know what, it's so cool that everybody's watching, because um, I, just to get a, like a real touch and, and uh, more communication with us, you can feel free to click the link down below and, and see what we're all about at the website housecallcoach.com. But there's a website I'm building out right now called writethatsong.com. Mm. And by the way, right when you think all the great domains are taken, they're not. Okay? They're not. And everything's in a name. A buddy of mine created a video series in 1986 up in Anchorage, Alaska, and ended up making over the course of eight or ten years two, almost three million dollars on three words. Because a video was just another video. Buns of steel. Okay, so really look at the name as something that is maybe tangential to what we're talking about here, but I think it's really important because when you start purposefully, eh, you know, building out what you're purporting to build out, you really have to be able to sink your teeth into it and make it communicatable. Okay, so write that song is going to be an outstanding website because I'm friends with the Osmond family and I, I, I write songs with the Osmond family, Osmond family up in Utah, and so people want to write songs with Nathan Osmond, and but his time is really limited. So now we're going to offer three different levels of writing songs from just Skype web chat and having a, a, you know, a synthesized demo with him singing to a full production weekend where you go have the full experience. So I'm building that website out because I want that. Because I'm a hack on the guitar, but I can play okay at an open mic. And I'm an so-so uh, singer, but what I know is it's a good idea. How do I know? Because I like it. And to answer the next, the next, the next question, the, the, the answer, the, the other part of the question is, um, I went, I, when I had the idea, I started right away. I started right away. I made all the calls, three or four calls I had to make, and so I, I start right away. I mean, what are you waiting for? Yeah. And my process is a little bit different because I'm a little bit more risk averse than Scott. I don't have quite as much money in the bank as he does. And so what I start doing is I start talking to everybody I know because one of my, um, one of the phrases that runs around in my head, in my mantra, I guess, is personal experience is not normative for the population as a whole. So I've learned that what I like, not many other people like, because I'm weird, I guess. Um, but if I find something that I think other people will, will like, then I start talking to other people about it. I talk to a lot of people. I talk to my mom. I talk to the different demographics that I think might be interested in it. You know, my younger cousins, my, my you know, friends at the pub or whatever. We talk, we talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. And then I, and then I stop thinking about it. And I put it away for a little while, and then I come back to it. It'll be on a list of an idea board. And I come back to it, and I say, OK, is that still a good idea? And if, th if it's still a good idea, then I invest a lot more time, money, and effort into it. And, and that's when I start right away. And I start calling people. And what we talk about is a lot of um, a short period of highly concentrated effort and activity. And what I find is that it takes just a few hours a day um, for just a couple weeks to just really dive deep into creating something and really pushing a lot of effort into it for a very short time. And if something's going to happen, it'll happen in that time. If it's not going to happen, it's not worth any more time. Uh, on the issue of time, I was talking to a buddy yesterday on the phone and, and something came out of my mouth and, it was, uh, and I liked it, so I'm going to share it. <laughs> I hope you'll like it. And it was simply this. It's the inaction on something that takes all the time. True. It's not the action on that thing that takes all the time. Because it doesn't take a lot of time. I've heard people, it took me five years to write that book. Really? So how much time, button the seat time was it? Well, it was, you know, three months. So it took you three months to write that book, not five years to write that book. So when that obstacle or challenge comes up, it, it, you just put it aside because that focused, intense, deliberate activity is going to result in some outcome. All right, so you guys have developed the idea. You're, you're going for it. At what point is it that you actually need to make money off of it and you know, actually monetize that? I think right away. <laughs> Having said that, there's Great. always a promotions and marketing campaign that has to be done. I mean, if you can clearly name it, find out who needs or wants it, right. Then you can start promoting and marketing this, as long as you have the right price point. So I would say, like with Fartopia, for instance, uh, my gal, she uh, designed three t-shirts, and they're for sale on fartopia.com. That's it. So that how do you spread the word of Fartopia? <laughs> like, what was the, the marketing you campaign for that? events and says Fartopia over and over again. <laughs> um, how do you spread the word? Well, of course, I've got my little 60 or so likes on Facebook. I've got a bunch of registered users, because some of the content is behind a registration. So. Um, 
you know, it's just it's just putting it out there. It's it, it's settings like this. It's an it, it's the funniest. Here's another key. If you can find a market where other people are doing your groundwork for you, or beating the pavement for you, you know the funniest, there's, there's news articles every year, a couple times a year, but the funniest subject, cross-cultural, cross-generational, cross-anything, is fart jokes. <laughs> so that work's being done for me. Okay, so that's how the word gets out there. Yeah, it's a great I love business model. I, I want to go back to the question of when do you need to start making money, and I think it's when the money runs out. Honestly, you need to start making money when you don't have any anymore because you can't invest another dollar into it if you're out of money. I mean, that's just the, the truth. <laughs> it's, it's simple economics, people. No, but, but honestly, I have a, a, you know, a lot of these YouTube sensations that are overnight sensations take about five years to build. Yeah. So it might take you five years of just plugging away at your, at your video blog, or I don't know what you call them, um, your web series. It might take just a long time to aggregate the viewers to the point where advertisers are starting to get interested. I've been um, producing and hosting a show on YouTube. Just It was a vanity project. It was a project that I was interested in. It kind of grew out of The Biggest Loser because people were constantly sending me products and saying, put this on the show, put this on the show. And I said, well, let me test them out first. So I created a show called Fit Test Dummies. So we test all kinds of different fitness products and programs and that sort of thing. So if you go to fittestdummies.com or you go to youtube.com slash fittestdummies, you can see this project that I've been doing for over a year. We have, you know, all of 200,000 views after, <laughs> after a year and a half. But what happens is it's a snowball effect. It's a snowball effect. So the videos that have been on there for two years have 20,000 views. Um, but we start getting... We, we do have time for questions, actually, but we start getting um, people calling us now, which is very interesting. You know what? The review, so, so for some reason, never shows up on the website. Find, I hate finds a way to like it. Things. I hate saying bad things about a, uh, um, a product, so if, if somebody wants to send me something and I automatically know it's terrible, I won't even take it. I don't, I wanna, I don't wanna review it. There was. There was one product that, um, that they asked us to review that we weren't sure about, and we got it, and it was terrible. And, um, and what we did is instead of giving it a negative review, we gave it a neutral review, and then showed people how they could effectively work the thing that the product purported to work without using the product. Oh, and uh, you got a question? Go ahead. Is that, oh, there we go. Um, yeah, I come from the advertising and branding industry. Excellent. And I have major brands, that's what I'm here for the next couple of days, uh, pitching a couple of shows that I have major brands who want to underwrite. Mm -hmm. But I keep getting told time and again, even in the session this morning, you know, that that's in conflict with the sa advertising salespeople at the networks. So don't even bring so that up. So don't go to, to the them. network. Huh? Don't go to the network. Well, I'm just saying. You you said that you had a, a, a you know company that underwrote you know a lot of the uh, production for the Biggest Loser. How the hell did did that happen? I mean, how, what's the what's the you know my 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 end point there? That's an interesting question, and I'm not sure I have a sufficient answer for you because the Biggest Loser is what you might call a legacy show. It was one of the first reality shows. It was a big budget reality show. It is a big budget reality show. And um, it, it came from a company who was very strong in creating a lot of, um, you know, branded entertainment. Uh, this came from Reveille back in the day. Well, the... Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's tough because if the, if the network already has a relationship with that advertiser, they want to exploit that relationship. They don't necessarily want you bringing it in. There's other strategies, and we can talk after, there's other strategies that you can use to get your content um, created and, and, and make money because the point is not to get a show on network TV. The point is to make money and, and create a lifestyle for you and your family. Yeah. Sure. I love it. 
those. Well, let's chat more after, and we'll so. figure out how you can help them spend that money. Yeah, okay. exactly. And, and GM has ten million more recently, by the way. <laughs> done and done. <laughs> nice. That's always a good thing to find <laughs> Talk out. Talk to Ski too. He's got the let's platforms. Let's do it. We, for we're you. definitely talking afterwards. I think that's a good point, though. At what point is? The, when do you go after these sponsors with with this content? You know, if you have a show and, and you, say, let's, let's start online, since there's a lot of people watching online. There's a lot of good content online. You don't necessarily need TV to break shows and stuff anymore. Absolutely. Break not. content. There's tons of people with millions and millions of YouTube views, myself included. Um, at what point is it that you start going after brands and sponsors? And how do you do that then? Well, one of the things that's difficult is the big brands, it's just to talk about YouTube, because that's usually where all the, all, all the, 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 the big numbers are. When a big name advertiser with really big customer loyalty they put their name out there. They don't know where their ad's going necessarily because they don't know if your search that resulted in that video is going to be, you know, a, a, is going to match their values, is going to match, you know, their mission statement. So they're they're a little reluctant to do that. Now, what they will do is they'll create content or partner up on content creation and then have that, you know, have that first minute and a half and you can skip after 10 seconds kind of ad, something like that. But they, they typically, that's a difficult, that's a difficult inroad because they're afraid that, because th what's going to come up is going to be something horrible or incongruent with their message. And where does the rubber, say, come off the road of, say, a brand you get involved with um, comes in and wants to do too much and overtakes the idea and makes it too much like a commercial yeah. or against what you think is going to work and where you want to take your product or your content? There was always a challenge with The Biggest Loser um, would be brands who want to overstep the bounds of the show. You know, if the show stands for a particular thing, you have to have an advertiser that dovetails with that. And oftentimes an advertiser will say, well, aren't my dollars big enough where you can say something that maybe you don't truly believe? And I'm sure you deal with that all the time, um, you know, where people want you to, to essentially lie about what you stand for. Um, you know, and Jillian Michaels, I think, is, is an amazing example of somebody who stayed true to her personal brand, even to the point of, you know, saying absolutely not. I, I can't. Yeah. I can't actually do that integration. I can't do that spot. Um, and that's something admirable. As much as it made my job difficult yeah. at times, it's actually something I really admire about her. Um, she kept true to her brand throughout. Um, I think you have to. I mean, just jumping in here real quick. Like I feel, unless somebody's going to pay you enough where you can retire and you never have to worry about anything the rest of your life, it's not worth. And you're just going to get flamed out. on YouTube. But you exactly. wouldn't want to do that anyway. Because then you, you can get miserable you, retirement. You can always get a check, but that check sometimes the, the most important important part is learning when to say no. Yeah. Hey, look, there's, the brand is only worth building if there's longevity. And if you're going to sell out early at that level, then don't do it because the, it, you will just wasted all your money. So I, I just think it's, it's something to be careful of, but it's also something to understand what those big advertisers are looking for and the reason why they're not doing something. So can you create a scenario by which they'll be willing to enter that arena? Yep. Where do you guys see the future going with in terms of content creation and monetizing it? You know, we're doing business with bodybuilding.com, the largest e-tailer, um, and, and their big, uh, I think their big thing is information, motivation, and supplementation. And we were fortunate enough to walk up, uh, actually go up to Boise, Idaho. Uh, and by the way, here's another thing. We didn't walk. Uh, we didn't walk. Dave flew, I drove. My kids and grandson live, up the, uh, grandson live up there. But here's something to remember. I drove 14 hours to visit family, but to have the meeting, essentially. And Dave flew up. And it's not cheap to fly into Boise for a 30-minute meeting. So the commitment level has to be there. I'll drive to, you know, I'll drive to Denver for a 15-minute meeting because it's usually going to go into 45 minutes to an hour. But I just want to drop that little nugget in because it's really important to know the commitment level that you have, to, you have to have. And then people will get it when you get there. And then you're very enthusiastic about what you're presenting. And nobody can present what you have as enthusiastically as you. So don't ever give that job to somebody else. I think it's really important uh, to keep that in mind. Now, as it relates to when to start plugging away for the money, we, we built a relationship with bodybuilding.com and we came in right about the, uh, the same time they were starting to, uh, starting to build out and revamp the fitness equipment and accessory part of their website. And we have innovative products on bodybearfitness.com. And Dave and I had such an outstanding meeting with them about maybe a week, two weeks later, they had their spokesperson the guy that stands there with the 12-pack <laughs> or whatever it is. And uh, they had him come to us 
And they had just met us a couple weeks before for 30 minutes. They had them come to us to say, listen, um, Ben, go to Dave and Scott at Body Bear Fitness and see if they can help you with your product uh, development and video product rollout and, and production. So he happened to come to LA. He came up to Dave's house. We met with him, and it was a great relationship, and it's a long-standing relationship. So how can you be an opportunity for someone else. There's opportunities and opportunists. You don't always have to be an opportunist. Be willing to be an effect. Be willing to create an opportunity for somebody. And that's what we did essentially through innovative products. A couple of guys that are very comfortable in their skin that go in to a meeting and say, look, here's some very cool products. This is what they do. There's no salesmanship. This is just really sound. And it, by the way, it fits right into your product line and your business model. And they said, thumbs up. So it, was, it went really well. I think you can't fool, you, you hit a t uh, an important point. You can't really fool people or brands anymore. There's so many options. People can really do their research. Consumers like, people always like to say, oh, the consumer's stupid. They're do Consumers are smart nowadays. They do every bit of research. How many of you guys, I'm sure, have just gone on, before you even buy something on, say, Amazon, even if it's something, you know, you'll look at the reviews and read it over and over before you actually go back and forth or on Yelp, you, you, you look at a restaurant. Now, there's so many people out there that, you know, there's so many products out there. There's so much content from TV shows, getting views and stuff. How do you stand out amongst all the noise and distortion out there? How do you get your product and your brand and your content to, to actually... We should turn that question there. back to you, Ski. You're, you're the master of it. Ski, how do you turn all that content, all that... <laughs> our, I mean, if you, if you guys are asking, that, uh, our philosophy, you know, with what I've done with Ski TV and in terms of us reaching over a billion views across various platforms has been, as we were talking, you know, off-site was, you know, I never really built our site and hoped people would come to us. I wanted to be everywhere people already were. Uh, I already had access from being a DJ and stuff to, you know, I was like, hey, my life is pretty cool. You know, I'm in the studio with Akon or, you know, I'm interviewing Snoop Dogg or on the road with Chris Cornell or whatever it is. Let's, let's just take a camera and throw it up. And we started, you know, just started out for something for fun and, and for vanity a lot too. And, you know, uh, from there, you know, we built these platforms and just started getting our stuff out everywhere. We didn't want people to come to us. And we just were like, hey, YouTube's out there. Why spend the money on bandwidth and building a flashy, you know, video player? We're not a programming company, so we're not going to necessarily, you know, always have the best technology. Let's use what's out there. And, you know, we've just wanted to flood the market with where people are because I think you know you have to make it easy. You said something, you said something very powerful. Okay, you're not in the technology business. Yes. I think here's three questions. Here's the note. Here's something you can uh, the notes you can take. This is very powerful, um, but it, it's 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 a good point right now. Is you really have to clearly define what business you're in, and then you have to find people that have the same goal that you have, and then you see, and, and then you need to find someone who's doing the business or in the business of doing what you don't do. So YouTube and any number of other you know, platforms uh, are, are in the business of doing what you don't do. So it's a perfect marriage because when your goals align, you're doing what you do, they're doing what they do because you're doing what they don't do. So it's a perfect marriage. So I think if you look at it that way and really clearly define what business are you in, so I'm an inventor, developer, and builder of stuff and ideas, an ideator, an innovator, but I'm not a manufacturer, okay? So I got to go find somebody who manufactures, all right? I'm an okay designer, I'm okay prototyper, so I can handle that part. But I've got to find someone who can handle the media, the media buy, because it's expensive, the production if it's going to be a long form infomercial. So it's really important, and it's funny at your age, I have a son your age, <laughs> that, uh, that you know that, it's kind of like you've stumbled into it or intuitively, intuitively know that. So I think that's really important to really clearly define what business you're in, or your producer, or your content provider, but of what, and get really niche focused, because that'll make your journey a lot less painful. Thank you, yeah, and I uh, appreciate the words, and we're going to take some questions from the audience in a second. But before we do that, um, for a lot of the people out there I know there's, you know, people out there that are like, hey, I don't have the, the money to really put behind and get behind this project. I, I have a great idea, but I don't have the manufacturing. I know the best reality show concept in the world, but how can I, how can I shoot it? What advice would you have to, get to them? How do they go out talk, and make it happen? Talk, 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 talk to people. Go where people are and talk to people. Nothing happens uh, in a vacuum. Nothing happens by yourself. This democratization of media that YouTube has created, the, the $200 camcorder and the you know $500 edit suite. Um, and now it's just your cell phone. You don't even need oh that, gosh, which is I crazy. See, I'm behind. I'm behind <laughs> now. Uh, I got to hang out with Ski more and catch up. But, but it's made us believe that we can do it alone. 
And there's a couple people who have done it alone, but even these YouTube sensations that, that it seems like they're alone have a whole, you know, I mean, remember Lonely Girl back in the day. There was a whole production company behind that. You know, they created these sensations because, um, you know, a really small snowball takes a long time to get going, but if you start with a nice big boulder or something and roll that down the hill, it's going to gather a lot more snow a lot faster. So I say talk to people. I mean, I was sitting at, um, at, at dinner the other night with my wife, and and uh, you know the the waiter that we see all the time comes up to us and okay it was a bartender, uh, the bartender he's and I'm like so what are you doing when you're not here and he's like oh you know we just did this movie and and you know I'm filmmaker I'm a filmmaker I'm like oh that's great he's I said I'm a producer I said I'd love to see your stuff and now we're producing a, a film with him and it's a, it was an amazing idea but if he hadn't taken that um, sort of and and said oh I'm a filmmaker I'm this is what I do. Now, he just met a guy who's got a little bit of money for development who's interested in him already because, you know, we've become friendly across the bar and, uh, you know, interested in a, a really interesting project. And so now we're working on it together. Um, so talk about your ideas. You know, a lot of people want to hold all their ideas close to their chest, but you got to talk about them. Ideas are a dime a dozen. You got to find somebody else who's also passionate. And the only thing that makes them uh, valuable is that they're yours. But here's something to keep in mind. I read this in a book recently. And it comes down, oh, I think it was, it was a lean startup. But anyway, the, the important part was uh, part of the book for me was this. Because people always don't want to show you their product, their idea. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I'm going to hold it close. Everybody's to always so scared, which Absolutely. is always, it's like, come on. So here's what I say, because this is what I read, and I believe it. If you think it's so special, go try to give it away. <laughs> you'll, have, you'll have a harder time giving it away than you'll have selling it. And then you'll really find out how valuable it is. Very true point. All right, I think we're going to open up. Um, does anybody out there have any questions? For Scott or for David? All right, if or not. for Ski. <laughs> Is that a question right up here? Oh, here we go. All right. Hold on one second. We'll here, wait for, for the, the microphone so, so the people watching at home can actually hear you. Hi, everybody, Hello. by the way. <laughs> So when you're actually, you have your content on your, your web channel or whatever, and then how do you actually go and approach, do you send a letter to an advertiser, or how do you approach no. them to say, hey, you know, I've got over a million hits on my site, and I mean, YouTube's already, you know, get, put ads on my videos and everything, but how do I go ahead and make more money off of it? I think they, they touched on it earlier with some great points. It's really about getting out there and networking and building it up. We've been working with, you know, some of the biggest brands in the world, not even Fortune 500 brands, Fortune 5 brands, and again, with them, it's about building relationships. Relationships Absolutely. on that and showcasing them and getting in with what it was. The the first um, product I ever marketed was a product called the T-Mobile Sidekick. It was made by a company called Danger at the time that made this product called the Hip Top. And the way I got to them, I'd find, I'd literally sit, I was 18 years old working at a record label, and I'd go through magazines and try to find cool things, find out, you know, newer companies. I wouldn't target, you know, the huge, huge brands because I knew they already had agencies. I wanted to find the new cutting edge things that I thought were cool. And I literally would overnight them letting and packages with a note saying, hey, I think you have a great product. Here's what I think we could do. And finally got a response from them and from them built it out and put together one of the most successful, you know, um, basically the first smartphone for, for the teenage market and for the youth market with the T-Mobile Sidekick. I ran the marketing for that for about three years, including creating limited edition devices and things like that. But I literally got that by just going out, thinking outside of the box, finding and doing the research on the marketing director who I found there. You know, writing a letter specifically to her, what I thought about the product, and overnighting it to her house. Advertisers are inundated with content. They have tons of content. They are not going to find you. It's very unlikely that you're going to get a million views and suddenly your phone's going to start ringing. It's very, very unlikely that's going to happen unless, I mean... And not to mention everyone in the world is going after them because it, every there's absolutely. so many content creators out there. That the great, it's the pros and cons. So people, I, I heard in another session, people buy you. It's absolutely true. The more attractive you can make yourself as a producer and your content content to the brand, the more likely they are to come on board with you. But it takes the hard work of picking, of finding out who you need to talk to, getting their telephone number, and getting them on the phone. I mean, literally, my career was built on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cold calls. And at first, when I first started, it took me 100 calls to get one yes. And then it took me 50 calls to get a yes. And then it took me less and less and less because I started sounding less dumb on the phone when I'd call people. And they taught me the language. And I used to do things. I'll give you some tips. Here we go. 
sales 101, right? They taught me the language because I didn't know the language. It was a new industry for me. So I didn't know the language when I first started calling advertisers. So I would call and I would talk to, uh, I didn't even know who to talk to, you know? I didn't know who the gatekeeper was even. Um, so I, I had this brilliant idea that I would call up and ask for the CMO, the chief marketing officer. And it was awesome because you, you call the CMO and one of two things happen. Either you get the CMO or you get the CMO's assistant or you don't get anybody. But So three things. But if you get somebody, you either get the CMO themselves and then you're, uh, and I usually failed on those. But if I got their assistant, I would say, now who is it that I should be talking to? Because I'd really like to talk to, you know, Bob Jones, but if Bob's not available, who is it that you know really handles uh, media buying for for digital platforms? Because you know we have this this amazing opportunity, and they say, oh, you need to talk to you know Sheila in blah blah blah, and give me the phone number. It's amazing how much information they'll give you over the phone if you're nice and uh, and sound like a normal person. If you talk, if you call up and start pitching your show idea, no chance. And by the way, your show idea you want to pitch may not be interesting to anybody. It may be something over lunch that spills out in a collaborative session yeah. that really is the, uh, the, the real winner. Absolutely. Right back here? One last question? Cause I think this is the last question. We're yeah. all, we could go on and on and on, but <laughs> we're out of time. We'll, we'll sneak one anyway, last well, one in for you. Buy us lunch anytime. We'll, uh, yes. we'll chat with you. Hi, I'm Cindy Bledsoe. Um, I also come from an agency background and worked in branding for a number of years before I stepped into television now as a producer and immediately wanted to do that because I really embraced the idea of branded entertainment and I thought that was fascinating. And I'm still working toward that. One of the parts of the business model I was most fascinated with was experiential branded entertainment where you provide the brand a direct experience with their consumers and which also is your audience. Where is that going now and where does that value into content centric programming? Yeah, I mean, we talked a little bit about that with The Biggest Loser and The Biggest Loser um, Resort. And what's your idea? What's that next idea? I don't, I don't know. Let's, let's sit down and chat about it. Let's have a brainstorming session because there's, there's a thousand ideas out there where we can say, okay, what is the content and then how does that translate um, into an experience? I'm working on um, a project right now where people will, will watch the show, they'll learn how to create cash flow for, or they'll see somebody who's created millions of dollars of cash flow. It's an inspiring story about this young couple who's 32 years old and they have millions of dollars of cash flow every year that they've created with a specific method. They also have a seminar series. And so viewers of the show will be able to roll in to the seminar series. And so that's an amazing opportunity to create something where you're creating entertainment. It's entertaining content. You get to live vicariously through these people who are living the American dream, who built a business and now have millions of dollars of passive income. Yeah. But then if you dig a little deeper and go on the website, you find out that you can go and experience it and, and learn how to do that same thing. So there's an example for you of an experiential model. But. Hopefully we have entertained you today. I know we could go on and on and on and on. Big shout to everybody that's been streaming us online as well as everybody in the audience. Make some noise for David and Scott right here. It's PitchCon Thanks, 2012. Guys. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.